it's your girl Cheryl Lynn, and you're watching Speak the League on Alamo City Podcast Network. Hey, this is George Iceman Gervin, and you listen to Sweet the League. Welcome, 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 welcome back. It is Monday. It is episode 10 of Sweep the League. It's Rudy Campos Jr. And Coach Gio should be on his way. He's actually kind of busy today. He said, you know, he didn't want to put up with all the knuckleheads again today, but he's going to try to make it on sometime soon. But we do have Derek Gerber joining us today. We're going to get into a lot of talk, man. As we posted, we're talking, uh, it was a Gervin tribute weekend. We're going to get into that with Derek. Um, he had a, a great time in Detroit. They were honoring George, uh, the Iceman Gervin. Also, Derek got honored as well. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about fans on the court and then fans off the court. A lot of stuff going on with that. MVP race with Derek Gervin on the uh, NBA side. You've got Shy, you've got uh, Jokic, you've got Jason Tatum. Who else considers the MVP award? Uh, we know somebody from the Spurs, right? Maybe Wemby, maybe, who knows? Maybe he's like maybe 10th on that vote or something. Who knows? We'll talk with Derek on that. Also, we're going to flash back on some more NBA vault. You guys love the NBA vault, so we're going to crack open that NBA vault, revisit it again with Derek Gervin. So, again, let's bring him on. It's going to be Derek. It's going to be myself. Rock might be joining us later on. Again, Gio's going to be trying to join But one. Let's get the math and the myth, the legend in here, Mr. Derek Gervin. Derek, brother, how are you doing, man? Man, you started my day off with calling me Mister. So hell, that right there makes my day pretty good. I'm, I'm doing fine, Rudy. I hope you're doing fine. I hope our listeners out there are doing fine as well. Oh man, as they are coming in, coming in. I've called you Mister for a long time. I first met you. I don't think I've ever. I think I called you Mister Gervin the first time I ever met you. I don't think I ever called you by your first name, at all, man. Yeah, Tim Gonzalez. Hey, Derek, we got Tim in here all the time, and I love it. He's a, he's a Blue Devil fan. He always tells me about my Tar Heels. I know. Uh, last time I checked, I think the Tar Heels are nine, Devils are ten. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know. I could be wrong. I have to check on that. But nonetheless, man, I'm gonna get into a, a little bit of talk here. I got to play this video real quick because we're gonna start off this episode of Sweep the League, uh, like we have been lately with some Spurs cheese man. The Spurs cheese man is gonna be uh, with the Gervin weekend. Let me get this started here for you real quick. So, like, I hear about the Spurs, this, the Spurs, that, y como que esto y esta, pero I never hear about the real Spurs cheese. Name it, por favor. All right, thank you, Spurs cheese, man. Girl, this is the Spurs cheese, man. So, <laughs> Our Spurs cheese, man, Derek, it's going to take us to the wonderful city of Detroit, your hometown. And people are thinking Spurs in Detroit. What are we talking about? The NBA finals from back in the day? No, we're actually talking about where the Gervin family's from, Detroit, Michigan. This past weekend, George was honored uh, in Detroit. And they were talking about uh, something that I want to get in with you as well, because you and I talked about it on the radio. We were at 930 uh, when it was St. Cecilia's gym. But also not only that. Uh, you were honored this past weekend as well. So let's let's try to dive into first. Let's get into your talk. You were honored at a local church in Detroit. How did that go, man? I saw the certificate posted on your Facebook page. How was that honor for you in the city of Detroit, your hometown? As you guys can see it there, certificate of recognition for Derek Gervin, man. How was that, Derek? Wow. It was uh, absolutely fantastic, Rudy, um, to get a call from Pastor Roberts. That right there was uh, just, for me, is amazing. And then to actually get to the uh, church and uh, I attended the service and I saw some people there that I hadn't seen in a few years and several years, actually. But to be recognized, man, in the city of San Antonio, uh, I've been here since 1982. So I've been here 42 years. Um, you know, I went to Detroit. I'm born in Detroit. I went to high school there. But uh, now I'm, I'm a native San Antonio in the last 40 some years. So to just be recognized for dealing with the young people, uh, dealing with the community, man, it was uh, fantastic. I really don't even have the words to describe it, but I will say I'm blessed. 
Awesome, man. Awesome. It was a very good blessing. I remember texting you over the weekend and you were letting me know what was going on. I saw some of your videos being posted. I want to get into the George tribute here. We got a super chat, Derek, from the Drew Show, sending $5. Appreciate it, Drew. Man, huge supporter of Sweep the League. Pretty, really appreciate it. His comment, if Mitch Johnson is the next Spurs head coach, the owners need to be replaced. He isn't head coach material. Looks like this is popping the front office. Terrible plan. Now, Mitch Johnson, I, I agree. I mean, Mitch Johnson is probably not my first choice when it comes to being the next Spurs head coach. Um, good mind, good basketball mind, but definitely not my choice for uh, the next head coach for the San Antonio Spurs. Derek, as far as Mitch Johnson goes, being the next Spurs head coach, according to uh, the Drew Show, how do you feel about that, man? I don't know if Mitch is the answer. Um, I'm kind of biased when it comes to the Spurs. Uh, you know, I've been around dealing with them since basically the 1973, 70, what, 75, 76, way back then. Um, yeah. I'm going to say this. This is kind of an off-the-cuff answer for me. The guy that I think should be the coach, if he was interested in coming into the coaching field, would be a guy uh, that wore long hair in San Antonio when he was playing. Uh, he's left. He's left-handed. I mean, the guy did it all. His name is Manu Ginobili. Uh, for me, I would like to see Ginobili uh, get his chance. Uh, we saw Steve Nash get a chance uh, with no coaching experience. So why not a guy like Manu Ginobili? If he was interested, that would be the perfect guy for me. Yeah, you know, Manu Ginobili. Uh, that would be that would be a really good hire for the San Antonio Spurs. I think Manu still needs a probably a few more years of coaching uh, seasoning before I could even consider him as a head coach. I think more for me, Derek, if Manu was to get his feet wet and maybe the G League with the Austin Spurs kind of maybe go around those ranks. I mean, we saw Quinn Snyder go around that whole that whole thing as well. So I think that helps Manu there. One guy I've mentioned to you a lot and one guy who I – if you're going to go with a young coach – one guy that I've mentioned to you before that I really am high on is Charles Lee. He's an assistant with the Boston Celtics. He was under Mike yeah. Budenhoser in Milwaukee, especially during that championship uh, championship run from Milwaukee. Charles Lee, I mean, he's he's a great coach on both sides of the ball. We're talking defense on offense. I, I mean, the the kid. Uh, he's got a mind of his own. I love the tree that he's been under when it's been under Budenhoser. Now he's in, like I said, in Boston as an assistant up there. Mm -hmm. I really like Charles Lee. Well, I mean, those are kind of the well, guys that we're well, looking well, at. I mean, touch you off, but what about like, Budenhoser? You know, I think Budenhoser would be a pretty good hire as well for the San Antonio. I'm saying you could bring Budenhoser, and if you wanted to get Charles Lee, maybe a little more experience, maybe a year or two or whatever. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't mind seeing Mike Budenholzer uh, here. He's uh, he's got a, a winning pedigree, uh, as we know. He's worked on the pop, and I think uh, he would be a great option as well. But I do have a lot of respect for Charles Lee. Uh, I think uh, maybe that I don't know if they were grooming Charles though. In case Mike uh, Mike uh, Mazula didn't work out. Yeah, I don't know if they were thinking about maybe Charles Lee becoming a um, Celtic coach. I don't know, but oh. um, I definitely like him. And I think he would be a good choice for the Spurs. I think so. I mean, you're right. I think maybe he's got that that plan in place to where Missoula is not working out in Boston. Charles Lee may get that opportunity up there. I mean, we had fans talking about possibly Steve Kerr being the replacement for Pop, but he just signed an extension. So he's going to be in Golden State for another two or three years. I got to ask you about that Golden State thing because you got and me. I got to say Joe Missoula, man. I'm not, I'm calling the man Mike. I got to like that. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> who he is, Joe Missoula. But I would like to see uh, – but the, Lee is a really good coach. Uh, I've kept up with him last year or two. Um, you can see him – continue to ascend in the coaching game. And I think he would be a great option for the Spurs because we could already turn it around. Oh, yeah, man. I would love to see Charles Lee get an opportunity, especially coaching the silver and black. You know what? If not even taking the head coaching reins, Derek, at least bring him in as probably your first assistant. I kind of like that idea. Get him under pop. Get mm -hmm. him some of the – get his feet wet in the San Antonio uh, organization. But Charles Lee is one guy that I'm going to continue – uh, to vouch for and you know what's kind of weird is there's another guy that's coming up in the rankings now he's uh, he got up into division one now I believe and you probably know him a lot better than I do but I've actually I've talked to him like one or two times on DM and that's uh, 
Former Captain Lade, James Silas's son, Xavier Silas, is coming on up, man. How how far before we see Xavier Silas getting these opportunities up into the G League and then maybe possibly head, not head coach, but assistant coach in the NBA? I'm hoping that uh, Xavier maybe, you know, could have the kind of success, maybe take the, the path that uh, Kevin Ollie took. Yeah. And uh, if they let him do that, I could see Xavier becoming a coach, a head coach. Um, I love the young man. I thought he was uh, a really hard worker as a player. Uh, he had to come in basically like I had to come in. We had to scrap and claw our way into the league, and he did that, and he became an NBA player. Um, I would love to see him being given an opportunity, uh, I would say, the G League maybe for a year or two. And then, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, hey, he's another good option. Uh, we don't have a lot of good options for the Spurs, <laughs> man. Um, it's It saddens me when you hear people say, like, San Antonio is not a media city. And, and I don't understand that because the city is continuing to grow. Yeah. But we also have our team with five NBA championships. So if we are in the media city, what is Golden State? And what is the Lakers? What are Boston? They must not be media cities either because we've already proven what we're about here in San Antonio. Yeah, 100%, man. Again, this is Derek Gervin, Rudy Campos, Junior Sweep the League. Comes to you Monday through Friday. 2 to 3.30 on the YouTube channel. Just go to Alamo City Podcast Network, smash that subscribe button so you get our, our uh, notifications where we're coming on live here. We're talking uh, NBA coaches as far as San Antonio Spurs because the Drew Show, big sponsor, big sponsor, big advocate for Sweep the League, big supporter too. Leaving a final super chat. Again, if you want to leave a super chat, we'll get to your questions as soon as possible. Drew Show, we appreciate it again. Uh, we both feel Mitch Johnson probably is not the next head coach of the no. San Antonio Spurs. Um, I, I don't even see it happening uh, within the next few years. If Pop is after this season, I don't see it happening at not all. In Mitch near Johnson, future, neither do I. Yeah, we got a uh, Tim Gonzalez sending out his congratulations, Derek, um, for wow. being honored in recognition. That was a uh, great. Uh, we've got Becky Hammond as head coach. No other will do. I love her style. Becky has a very good style. She proved it in the summer league by winning that championship. She's proven it with the Las Vegas Aces. She's doing a hell of a job there. You know, the thing, too, is I want to get back into uh, this past weekend, Derek. I know Tim Gonzalez had a couple of questions for you when it came to some NBA players. He's been dying to get to you on them. But George was honored this past weekend in Detroit as well as you were. Uh, like I said, it was a weekend for the Gervin family in Detroit. The entire Gervin family was being celebrated. George and they were trying to raise money for St. Cecilia's. Now, for everybody out there that doesn't know about St. Cecilia's Gym in Detroit, let's just say that if you think about the, uh, the Rucker in New York City, that's St. Cecilia's for Detroit. I mean, it is it is like the mecca of basketball for Detroit. And actually... I've even kind of seen a debate where is it St. Cecilia or is it the Rucker? Which one is <laughs> which is the one that takes the, the leap for everybody? Uh, you hear all the stories about Julius, uh, Dr. J and Kobe and all these guys going to the Rucker, playing in Rucker Park. But you don't ever hear the stories about St. Cecilia. Is it? I was hearing stories from you. I did my research from way back then. But hearing about George going to St. Cecilia's and you having Magic Johnson, uh, I think even Isaiah Thomas played there a couple of times. Many, right? many, many stars. I, I want you to let everybody know here about St. Cecilia's because, again, <laughs> they hear about the Rucker. They don't ever hear the folklore of St. Cecilia. Well, the Saint, man, we call it the Saint uh, in Detroit. And uh, I mean, it, it's like you say, it's a, that's a very good comparison, Rucker Park. Uh, the only difference, the same is indoors. Yeah, It's a gym that uh, if people, say you come in town, you know how some of the guys uh, that stay in shape or stay in pretty good shape, if they come in town to a city that, that's not even where they live or where they're from, and they want to get a good workout. And so you want to play some uh, really good pickup ball, I'll call it, because that's all it is. They aren't getting paid for it. But the first place you would think of when you come to Detroit would be uh, St. Cecilia. Yeah. And so George used to play there, uh, Rudy, and the guys would, like, find out. They would have already had a gym booked. And then all of a sudden they get a call that George wants to come in town. Uh, he's going to be in town and he's going to play. Uh, he wanted to play next weekend. So there was a group that would uh, actually cancel their hours at the gym. Yeah. They had the gym booked. They would give that time up so that George could come in and play. And when he's come in and play, man, I tell you, um, it, it, it's unbelievable. Some people might not believe it, but this is a true story. And I've told you before. Yeah. 
The Saint Cecilia had uh, windows outside that were high up. Okay, so yeah. I would say where you look when you get to the all the way up to the window, you would have to stand on someone's shoulder to look in the window. And man, it was amazing to see people actually climbing up on someone's shoulder just to get a preview of what was going on inside. Uh, there was no room inside, standing room only. Uh, they had a stage that people stood by the stage. They sat on the stage. It, it Man, it was surreal. I, I couldn't believe it to this day that people would come out to see my brother play. Uh, and they come out and they supported him and he would put on a show. Uh, I actually put, posted a video yesterday about 20 minutes of him talking about how the fans responded. Mm -hmm. And for him to still remember it, that should tell you basically all. I don't have to say much more. They 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 really, really, really wanted to see a show. And George made sure he gave them a show. And it, it was just surreal. And to see the event the other day, um, the event was hosted by Jalen Rose. And I'm sure everybody out there knows who Jalen Rose is. Uh, it was Jalen Rose and Derek Coleman was part of the sponsorship. He was helping out. Um, all the Detroit Pistons were there except maybe two of them. So for me, it was great because I got to meet uh, Kay Cunningham. I got to uh, meet Isaiah Stewart, who I'm a new fan of. I, I know a lot of people think uh, the young man is having some problems right now. As you know, he suspended the yeah. three games. Yeah. But I got to meet him and actually talk to him, Rudy, face to face. And you could tell when someone's really listening to you, right? Oh, so yeah. the young man seemed like he was on. He's not a bad young man from what I could see. And the best thing of it all is he got married that day. <laughs> and so for him to even show up at the event, man, I'm sure they didn't. They wouldn't have made him. They would have gave him a pass if he didn't show up. Yeah. But he showed up anyway. Uh, and all these guys were great. I got to see Steve Smith. Uh, all Detroit legends, Doug Smith, who used to play at the University of Missouri. There were many guys. My old teammates, uh, Derek Coleman and Terry uh, Terry Mills. Uh, there was Greg Kelser, who used to play with Magic Johnson at Michigan State. And he was catching the alley-oops Larry, against Larry Bird in Indiana State. Mm -hmm. So it was absolute fantastic turnout. Um, it was just full. Um, the Pistons were there, very supportive. Uh, Monty Williams was there. Uh, the general manager, Troy Weaver, uh, the guy who was a radio legend in Detroit by the name of George Blaha, uh, who's retired now. And I wish people would look up George Blaha. He had a very fantastic career. It was just an excellent night, man. And I was just glad to be a part of it. Yeah, man. I, I saw the videos of you uh, when you posted on your Facebook page. And I saw the one where Jalen and George were talking and – you know, the one question I think that stood out to me was how and it's funny because I know I've talked to you many times about it where Jalen said, you know, you've got Kareem had the signature sky hook and, you know, so and so had the signature move and your signature move was the finger roll and is the finger roll. Everybody, when they see finger roll, it's like, oh, hold up, you know, that, that's George Gervin. But it's funny because not too many people realize that George wasn't the first guy the finger roll i mean let's go back will chamberlain well, had his version connie hawkins the hawk had his version george i think just brought some flair to the finger roll and that's why everybody thinks like well it's george gervin's move actually he put everybody in their place like well, wait a minute hold on no no, you got to give credit where credit's due these guys were doing it before me i just added a little bit of flair to it you know that was the one part of the conversation that i really enjoyed that i'm not people actually remember or even know about I'm, I'm glad he was humble because he makes sure not to uh, take the limelight away from those guys. Uh, they were dropping it down in the rim, but they still was finger rolling their version of the finger roll. And of course, Doc had the big hands and his version. Yeah. George, the difference was, and Jalen talked about it, George was below the rim on his shot when he did it. Yeah. And on his way up, he would throw it. I mean, the ball would go over the top of the backboard. Man, that's how high up he shot it. And he just put his own version onto it, his own spin. But at no point does he ever claim to uh, and, and be the inventor of the finger roll. And I appreciate that from my brother, man, because he's being hum very humble. But he's being honest. He just yeah. – uh, he had an imagination. And he watched all those guys. He studied all those guys. He respected all those guys. And then when you're already playing with Dr. J, when you come right into the league – and you're playing with Julius Irvin, man. Can you even imagine what kind of feeling that's <laughs> like? Uh, Doc was still establishing himself, but he was doing it on a quick pace. 
And so George, you know, playing against him one on one every day after practice. And I guess they might have practiced and played horse, maybe see who had the finger roll, the best finger roll. And maybe that motivated George. Oh, I know, man. That, you know, there was a that was a great evening um, because it, you got to mingle with a lot of a lot of NBA players, current NBA players for the Detroit Pistons, uh, Detroit legends, you know, Derek Coleman, Jalen Rose. You you were there. Uh, even Tobias Harris's dad was there. Uh, mm-hmm. I just saw a post picture of him. You and I, we've, when we talked before, it's, we've talked about Tobias Harris's dad as well. I mean, it, it was just a great night in Detroit. Uh, for the Gervin family, I mean, it probably is a night that everybody wishes that they could have attended. But uh, I would have loved to have been there, but I probably would have been kind of in the corner, like, um, what's going on here? You know, looking at all <laughs> these redwood trees standing next to me, man, because I'm a little short guy. So, I mean, we're well, getting congratulations, Derek, to you and your brother. Hey, and Rudy, and uh, Tim, um, let me ask you first. I want to uh, thank Tim for the kind words about my recognition. Yeah. But yeah, the two people that were missing were uh, Chris Weber, and the other was um, Spencer Haywood. And oh, I watched man. Spencer Haywood. Spencer was watching the women's game out at uh, the University of Southern California at that time, mm-hmm. so he didn't make it. And Chris Weber was the only other guy that was mentioning it. But yes, he did play at the uh, Saint Cecilia Tim. I actually played there only one time. Uh, we used to have what they call a Christmas tournament, Rudy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I played there one time um, and our team was like rated number two in the city at that time. And we were playing against Cooley High and not the movie Cooley High. That's Chicago <laughs> High School. So from Detroit, Cooley High. And they were rated number one and we were rated number two. They beat us that night. I'll never forget the score. Ninety to eighty nine. That was our first loss that made us 13 and one. Uh, I had thirty nine points, but we came up short. So that's my best memory as far as playing at St. Cecilia, the only one, the one and only time, and we lost, my man. We lost. Well, I uh, I did play against St. Cecilia in San Antonio in high, in middle school. Actually, it's from St. Gregory's, and uh, I, we won that game. I remember we won <laughs> that game, uh, but definitely isn't the St. Cecilia's uh, up in Detroit. Just to get a great, great weekend. We got a question from Tim here. Uh, for you, Derek. Derek, prime Allen Iverson versus prime Russell Westbrook. Who wins that one-on-one matchup? I'm gonna take Russ because of size. Um, I know Allen and Russ played was uh, at one time. People remember Russ was a pretty good defender. Yeah, and I think uh, he's a little too strong and too big for uh, Russ. It would be, I mean, for Iverson, it would be a really good matchup. Uh, if they played a seven-game series, of course, both of them would win some games. But I would probably take Russ if they play the series. I would take Russ four games to three. So you're taking Russ. Me, I don't know, man. I'm not too. I'm not too sure who I would take. I mean, Russ has probably the uh, probably advantage, like you said, size wise, than Iverson. But you think it would be easy? It would be easier for Iverson to score. On no, him? because the, the reason I take that's why I take Russ. If if Iverson was a better jump shooter. Mm-hmm. Remember, Iverson shot 42% for his career. Now, if you're talking Steph Curry versus Russ, then I'm going to go with Steph because of the outside, the range, and the creativity off of the dribble and all that. But AI is basically the crossovers and trying to get to the basket. And I yeah. just think that Russ could have stopped him often enough to be able to um, you know, get the ball back and then back Iverson down, basically. And there's nothing AI could do once Russ gets to the basket. Because Russ has elevation. He just jumped over AI. It would be a good series, but I would take, or if it was just one game, I would take, I would barely give the edge to Russell Westbrook. Gotcha. Okay. I, you know what? I can't even, I can't argue it because that's kind of a, I would say probably Russ because of the, like you said, the defender on him and he's got the size on Iverson. So that would actually be a pretty good matchup. We need to get that for All Star Weekend, Derek. Something like that going because that would be pretty awesome. John's in here now. Iverson versus Steve Nash. Is that a mismatch? Hmm. I don't know. Iverson, Steve Nash. Was Nash because was Nash a really good defender, in your opinion? I don't think Iverson is either. That's what I'm saying. But I would rather see that than if I'm going to play, put Russ out there, I'd rather see Russ against somebody like a Derrick Rose or a Baron Davis or someone who also has some physicality. Yeah. If you're going to go small guys, I would rather see, you know, I would put a Nash in there or Kyrie or someone like that. Now, Kyrie versus Iverson. 
I mean, that's oh, kind of that's box office, sir. That would be box office there. That's Kyrie box, versus that's, that's, box, that's box office. And I, hope <laughs> the NBA, I actually hope the NBA is listening because uh, I've talked to you before about how they can make the All Star game better. And what better way than a one on one or two on two, something like that? I think yeah. that would be something uh, that would pique the guy's interest. One on one, yeah. two on two, something like that. So a good representation for like NBA All Star Weekend because you mentioned it, you know. But my thing too would also be do a three on three competition, but where <laughs> every team is represented. I mean that that would oh, be you know you can have your All Stars, great, mm-hmm. you've been voted as All Stars, but get a competition where every team is is involved now. MLB sort of they used to do. I don't know if they still do. I haven't watched the All Star Game in a couple of years, but they used to do it to where at least one representative from each team was there. And that's something where I could see the NBA doing. Hey, why not do a three on three? You get three guys from the team, maybe four or five. That way you have some subs in there. Uh, But a three on three tournament, just let them play throughout the weekend. You know, kind of like the the round ball ruckus was in San Antonio a long time ago. Yeah, I I played in that. (laughs) I I played in the round ball ruckus one time. That was awesome. That was over. I played played in there with your former coach, uh, Keith Edmondson. Oh and my finish, God! Finish, finish Dimbo. So I played with two uh, San Antonio legends. Oh man, I would have loved to have seen that. And Keith Edmondson, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I I apologize. I knew I got on your bad side when I was at St. Gregory's, but one day we'll talk about it. Out, we'll talk it out and see what I really did because I still don't know what I did at this time. But I remember the round ball ruckus. That was actually pretty cool. Actually, where we played was at St. George Marionette on Babcock. Is where they yeah. had the, that tournament. Well, he um, yes, sir. Yeah, so that was actually fun. But something like that for the NBA during All-Star Weekend, I think that would be awesome. John John is saying, you never beat us, Rudy. I went to St. we were undefeated. It was either at St. Gregory's or when I played CYO. I know I played at St. Cecilia's gym a few times. So I'm going to have to look it up. If I can find the yearbooks and I have the I have them somewhere here, we're, we're going to have to get into that because I, <laughs> I, I know we went undefeated at St. Gregory's. So Tim is in here as well. How about Wemby and Gervin in late 70s and 80s? So your brother teaming up with Victor Wimbanyama, they, they, I tell you what, all of our fans, Derek, all of our listeners, they love to talk old school basketball, old school football. We're just going to continue right along here on Sweep the League. But your brother and Wimby, man. Now, what I look at is everybody sees George as a scorer, finger roll, you know, one of the masters of the game on the offensive side. Wimby's got offense as well. Wimby's got defense. But what people fail to realize is how good of a defender George was. That would be a pretty nice tandem right there between Wimby and George. Well, what George would do, um, he wasn't a great um, defender as far as moving himself, you know, moving laterally. But what he was good at is he could stand a step or two off of you yeah. and kind of entice you into taking the jump shot. He didn't give you room to drive. So a lot of guys, you know, would settle for the jump shot. And then he had long enough arms to reach up and block the shot. So a lot of people might laugh when you say good defender. Um, but if you, I will say this, a piece of history, and they can look it up. He's the first guard in NBA history to block 100 shots in a season. Yeah. And as we know, they talk about that a lot now because uh, Dwayne Wade did it. Uh, Michael Jordan did it. Uh, but George did it five times. So to block 100 shots, I mean, he did at least play a little bit of defense. Uh, I never remember him being the type of guy that wanted to score 35, 40 and give up 35 or 40. Yeah. So he always talked about that. If I get 40 and my player, the guy that's defending me, gets 12, then I must have played pretty good defense. Uh, and sometimes his offense was his defense. So. Yeah. <laughs> him wearing out the guy on the other end, having to guard him. And that made <laughs> the other guy's legs uh, not as strong, I would say, on the offensive end. So, yeah, he played some defense. I won't call him a great defender, uh, but he he at least attempted. Yeah, and I think, you know, the good thing about George playing with Wemby is that if you were to beat George off the dribble, you've got to deal with the seven-footer guy <laughs> you know, on the back end, which we've seen this year, Wemby getting five blocks in a few games. I mean – that's something that I think is going to be a staple. I was actually on a, an episode of Locked On Spurs with our good friend at Jeff Garcia at Locked On uh, Spurs. And, you know, him and I kind of talked. Uh, and the episode's going to be coming out tomorrow. So be sure to take a look at it, Locked On Spurs, tomorrow. But uh, to give you a little preview, him and I kind of talked a little bit about Wimby, you know, compared to like Wilt Chamberlain and stuff. And I told him, you know, I don't see 
I don't see Wemby getting 100 points in a game. The, the, the minutes restriction, not only restriction, they just won't play him as many minutes as they did Wilt. And Wilt played an entire game. Uh, he got the ball. He got a lot of rebounds. But again, where Wilt's here, a lot of his defenders were here. This day and age, Wemby's here. And you got Joel Embiid, these guys that are like right here. So it's a lot tougher to score 100 points in a game. Will it ever happen? It may. But I don't find it as Wemby being the guy to do it. Now, blocks in a game? I definitely see the way he moves, the way his recovery on the defensive side. I could definitely see him breaking the blocks record with no doubt. You know, Elmore Smith for one game, I believe it's 14 blocks. Yeah. Um, I could see Wimby uh, because he's already gotten 10. Yeah. And he's only a rookie. So I could see him as he gets more acclimated to the league and he learns to pick his spots uh, a little more defensively. I could see him getting uh, 10 of um, 14, 15 blocks. Uh, so I'm not going to write that off as being crazy. I think it's a very high possibility. And I'm very high on this young man, Rudy. Um, I think his intelligence is off the charts. Uh, maybe it's because he was already, you know, getting acclimated to the pro game overseas. <coughs> Rudy, y'all have to excuse me, too, because remember, I'm just coming back from Michigan. You're good, man. You're good. Um, yeah, you know, it was cold, a little colder there as opposed <laughs> to here. But, Rudy, tell me this. I don't want to flip the script on you, but when you look at Wemby, mm-hmm. and I know he's a rookie and all that, and I'm not talking about his size because, as you know, you get girth just by playing. When you get more experience, you start putting on the weight. Yeah. What, what, where do you see his career possibly going? Because I think he can do right now. I'm trying to figure out what's his weaknesses. Um, he can pass the ball very well. Uh, he, he, I mean, to me, he can do it all. So I'm just trying to figure out still, just like Michael Jordan. I couldn't figure out Michael Jordan's weakness. And if you hear some of the guys that played back then, they still to this day can't figure out what his weakness is. They say it was his jump shot when mm-hmm. he first came in the league. But, of course, we know he corrected that. What do you see? Where do you see? What is Wemby's weakness? So I actually have something of a weakness that I've actually, I think I talked to Jeff about earlier. Um, The one thing I see that I would like to see him improve, is it a weakness? Not necessarily, but it's something that he can dramatically improve in. And that's his, this, now when I say it, it's kind of, it's kind of awkward here. His decision-making on the offensive side, like being two or three steps ahead. So where that comes in is like I said, an off season with Hakeem Olajuwon. Because yeah. you know Dream was two steps ahead of his opponent. He knew what he wanted to do. I think if you can get Wemby to face up a little bit more, but already know what he wants to do. So it's more of preparation, uh, knowing what you want to do, being two steps ahead to where I think that would elevate his game a lot more. He's You're right. There's very little weaknesses that we've seen so far. Now, my other part of the weakness is year two, Derek. You've got a whole year under your belt. Coaching staff already have seen you play for a whole year. It's like the quarterback effect in the NFL. You have a whole year of this guy dominating the league. When you go into that second year, sometimes you hit that wall because now defensive coordinators know how to they know how to, you know, run packages at you. They know what defense to play on you. They kind of go at your weaknesses because hey, if you're a coach in any professional sport, you can find a weakness in somebody somewhere. So I think him getting prepared to actually make a move. Not so much think about it, you know, on the defensive side. Okay, I know this is coming up. Going on the offensive side, I'm two steps ahead of this opponent. Let me make my move now. That's kind of the only weakness that I see in his game right now that I would like to see improve is his decision-making. Not necessarily basketball IQ, just his decision-making on the offensive side. And you know why I think it's going to improve? And that's a good point Um, because you and I, and we talk a lot. I don't know if people realize how much we talk. Yeah, almost daily. Uh, We talked about his rebounding. If you remember uh, early in the season, what he's getting five rebounds, three rebounds. And we talked about that. And it seems like from that point on, I don't think he was listening to us, but (laughs) from that point (laughs) on, man, he started getting double figure rebounds. Yeah, And I think that's going to be something he's going to stay mindful of because if you look at guys like uh, DeMontis Sabonis, mm-hmm. you see how many double-doubles that guy's had this year, man. It's Easily. absolutely ridiculous for him not to make the All-Star game with all those double-doubles. Yeah, And I think um, Victor is going to fix every question that we have about him. It does become tougher once you go around the league and everyone gets familiar with you and they start doing the scouting reports. Yeah. But I just figure if you bring in a, a higher quality players around, if you put higher quality players around him, 
like say just starting with a Trey Young mm -hmm. or starting with a, a wing player who's been around the league and made a name. I think those bringing those kind of players uh, help him tremendously. And then I, all the things we're talking about is, that some people might see as weaknesses. I just see him continuing to ascend, man. He's the kind of guy that uh, wants to win. He wants to get better. He wants to make a name for himself. And he wants to make a name for himself by winning. There are some guys that just want to make a name for themselves and they don't care about it's the all team. Stats. It's all I, hate stats. To bring up, I hate to bring up a Jordan Poole or someone like that, a young guy like that. But if we're going to talk about it, I'll bring it. But Poole um, seems like he plays for himself. And that's why he's no longer in Golden State. I don't see Victor being that kind of guy. I see a Victor being a very adaptable guy. And if you bring in players around him, I think that's what he wants. But I think his sky, I mean, the sky, man, the ceiling is, is whew. Yeah. I don't even know if he has a ceiling. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be honest. I know when before the Spurs drafted Wimby, uh, you and I, like I said, people don't realize how long, how much we talk. We talk almost daily um, for Derek and I. But I remember, I'll, I'll be uh, open to admit it. I don't. I say stuff, but I always say stuff not for clickbait or likes or whatever. I say it because of what I see. Uh, you've always said the vision test is what, you know, proves a lot of things. And for me, my biggest concern with Wimby coming in was how would he transition? Because when he played overseas, you, you and I were both talking, when he played overseas, it wasn't like he was playing the elite part of international play. It was right. – you know, we it wasn't great competition, so his transition for me was going to be tough. I figured, okay, he's coming into the league. He's probably going to get the ball stolen a lot. He's going to be making a lot of mistakes. To my surprise, his adjustment, Dirk, has been unbelievable to the NBA game. I I surely, you know, say apologies to Victor Wimanyama because I was <laughs> unsure how him coming into the league, knowing that the competition was not great internationally where he played, but he was able to adjust and we're seeing the type of player that he can be. So the other thing too, Derek, is the fact that the Drew show is in here as I'm getting the number, like that's crazy. Um, the Drew show is in here. He drops another $5 super chat. Hey, Drew show again, appreciate it. Dropping the $5 uh, super chat. Anybody want to drop a super mm -hmm. chat by all means do it. We will get to your questions, get to your comments. We love the support we have from all you guys. Again, this is sweep the league, Derek Urban, Rudy Campos Jr. The Drew show says, congratulations on the award, Derek. Carmelo, Carmelo Anthony said on his podcast that George Carl hated George Gervin when they both were on the Spurs. Is this true? So I'm going to give you the uh, the floor on this. And again, we we talk about whatever, Derek, and nobody's wow. on the spot here. But um, there's been some rumblings here and there. I see George on Twitter every now and then, and he'll say a couple of things that are mind scratching. But I've never heard the true insights about Spurs, George Carl. Well, first, I want to thank Drew for being a part of the show. And uh, thank you for congratulating me on the award. I appreciate it sincerely. George Carl, uh, I won't say he I won't say he hated George, but let's just say sometimes <laughs> you learn that in this game, you don't have to love who you're playing with. You just have to respect them. Right. And for whatever your reasons, you might not like a guy, particularly like a guy. Sometimes it could be because they're maybe roughing you up in practice. Uh, Cause you know, George Carl was a very aggressive guy mm -hmm. and George Gervin is kind of guy that's going to get you off of, you know, these things here. So they maybe went, it, you know, went back and forth a little bit uh, over the years, but George, I won't say George Carl hated him because I know George Carl personally. And he's also a very good friends with uh, one of my first coaches uh, when I was the CBA rookie, my, uh, as a CBA rookie, Terry Stotts was my assistant coach. And George Carl and Terry Stotts are, I mean, they're, hey, that's them. They're that close. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, George Carl was kind of a, it might seem standoffish to some kind of people, to some people back then that knew him. But I won't use the word. I think hate is kind of strong. Uh, sometimes you just have personalities that don't uh, mix. And as the years went on, you know, they kind of uh, fixed those problems. So, yeah, you own it, though, Drew. Um, I won't say there was a love relationship. Sometimes it's a love-hate relationship. So, yeah, you're right on the money. Uh, they did have some kind of some issues, uh, but they fixed those issues as they got a little older. So, yeah, but you're on it 100%. Yeah, great question from the Drew Show. Hey, that's a good thing I love about having Derek on with us at Sweep the League, part of the family here, is that you, you guys, you know, a lot of people – 
they they hear radio, Derek, and they don't ever get the uh, the full effect. But with you on the show, it's like you gave everybody, you know, background stories and backstories from, you know, behind the locker room and, you know, all this other great stuff. You and I talk a lot about it all the time when I keep mentioning that because we, we do talk a lot about it. But, yeah, guys, if you have any questions, any super chats, especially drop some super chats in here, ask whatever you want. We definitely will get to every single question and comment. That's kind of what Sweep the League is. We we come in with an agenda and then the, the listeners take over. So we're like, you know what? It's it's a listener's show, and it's it's a podcast for the people, by the people. Wimby uh, has one weakness, his height. Players can easily steal the ball if he tries dribbling. That was a mm. huge – for me, Derek, that was a huge concern because at 7'4", I was taught by um, Coach Conchas to St. Gregory's. I was taught by uh, even Keith Edmondson, a good friend of yours, all the way up to Coach Cortez, you know, when I was kind of practicing with him. You know, as tall the taller you are, the further the ball has to go down. So if you're having a younger, a smaller defender, you know, it's easy for them to swipe that ball. And that was my concern. But I haven't really seen that this season from Wemby. He's actually, <laughs> for the most part, has taken care of the ball pretty well. Uh, Darth, I, I somewhat disagree because of, if you remember, he's even net made, he's net made the player already. He went yeah. and put the ball through the, already <laughs> through their legs as a rookie. And so that was phenomenal. I think he's not a bad ball handler at all. And I think he's conscious of uh, the size, of his size difference. Mm-hmm. And he seems to carry the ball. I mean, he doesn't turn the ball over a lot. He's a really good ball handler. Um, he's actually got a lot of craftiness to his game. But I understand if you were talking about, I would say, and Rudy, you know this, I would be more worried if the league was playing the type defense like an Alvin Robertson. Oh, yeah. It was the help defender. You know, Alvin would help out on guys like that. I mean, then Alvin basically timed your dribbles. But yep. you don't see that as much today. Um, and I, I think Wimby's a pretty good ball handler. And I think uh, he's a pretty astute guy. He's going to continue to get better. And he's mindful of all these things that we talk about. I, I He must even read some of the stuff, man. I'm going to say, you know, some players don't go on social media or want to read stuff about themselves. I think he reads the positive and he reads the negative. And I think he wants he's the type of guy that wants to prove people wrong. So um, he might not be the greatest ball handler right now, but he's the greatest ball handler I've seen at 7'4". Oh, yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, you haven't really seen anybody over 7'2". That's, R- Ralph that's... Sampson could handle the ball a little bit, but it was a different game. Yeah. But Ralph couldn't handle it as far out on the floor as uh, Wimbin Yama. So I just think he's going to continue to get better at everything that – uh, each every single category in the NBA, I think he wants to master those as much as he can. And I think he'll work hard and try to make those things happen. Yeah, 100%. And you bring it up, uh, Alvin Robertson, again, I, I'm i a, I'm a fan of Alvin Robertson, you know, as a basketball player, a huge fan of Alvin Robertson. But I learned from him and I learned from another guy that you count the ball from your hand, from the palm to the ground, you make the count. When the count is even, that's when you go for the swipe. You know who was the other guy I learned it from, Derek? Tim Hardaway was the other guy I learned it from. Well, he's from down here, Texas, El Paso. So Yeah, Alvin Robertson and Tim Hardaway, for those of y'all playing basketball out there, all you got to do is from the palm of the hand to the bounce of the ball, count it. Once it's even, yeah. you take a swipe. Rudy, I did that. I got, if you look at my stats when I played, yeah. even in the NBA, I got a lot of steals. Yeah. And a lot of the steals were on the things you're talking about right now. There's certain guys that you know are, I would say, more strong hand dominated. If they're right hand, they're more right hand dominated. Yeah. And so they got the ball there. And it's basically there. You just being able to time them. You get familiar with them. Mm-hmm. You do the scouting report, all that. You look at videos. And you, there's some guys you can just capitalize on when you play against them. And I was one of those guys. I wasn't a great defender either. But, man, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to be there. And, and I'm going to go, if you, if you put the ball in front of me, I'm going for the steal. I'm not oh, going to yeah. over, I'm not going to go to the point where I get us, where I get us beat and it's four against five or five against four because I gamble and I'm out to play. But I'm, I'm going to go try to gamble if you put that ball in front of me. Oh yeah, man. And I'm going to, I'm going to let out some of my secrets here. When I used to play at St. Gregory's, I, uh, I was in the post a lot. I didn't really play the guard position. Actually, Keith Edmondson put me at the guard position a little bit. And I don't know why I hated the guard position, but <laughs> I learned to play point guard and CYO. I loved playing point guard growing up, but at St. Gregory's, I love the post area. So 
I kind of had the uh, little thing that where people would in the post and I'm I'm guarding them. I would always use the little pull of the shorts, you know, the tug of the jersey to kind of when I knew that ball was coming in, I would grab the shorts away from the ref and just pull it down on one side because hell man, when you're a kid, you feel your shorts coming down. Your first instinct is, oh my God, let me get my shorts. <laughs> the ball will be right there. Now I got caught a couple of times and you know, I got in trouble a little bit for a couple of times, but there's little things here and there. Um, a buddy of mine used to say when he would be there, he would used to kind of use the finger to like tickle him a little bit every now and then. And it kind of, you know, does them off. So many things you can do as a defender, not only just the steel part, but there's so much things you can do as a defender. Drew shows back in here, man. And he said the Melo said the reason that he and George had heat when they were in Denver was because George Carl and George Gervin didn't get along. Carl hates stars like Melo and Gervin. No, nah, you won't get an argument from me there. Um, I've, I've heard some of the things he said about uh, Carmelo Anthony. Uh, some of them I thought, I won't say out of bounds, but they weren't things that I thought needed to be said. Uh, sometimes we don't have to say everything that we think. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, George Carl has have had a history. There's certain guys that have a history. Pat Riley has that same history. Uh, he seemed to not get along very well with some players and stars on the other teams, of course. Yeah. Uh, but George Carl, from as far as I know, you know, he's not a bad guy, but, you know, he might have had a few deficiencies, but we all do. So you just live <laughs> and learn. George Gervin is fine with it. Um, if you look at them now today, I know George Carl has been ill and all of that, and I'm hoping I'm still praying for him. Yeah. Uh, but we live and we learn. Uh, but one thing they did, they did learn how to coexist as players. And you do your job and then you go home. And if you don't have a relationship with a guy off the court, I, you know, that's understandable. Uh, they just made it work, though. They still made it work. They both did their job and they did it at the highest level. Yeah, for sure. So what we're going to do here, let's take a break. We're going to get a little commercial break in here. Tim Gonzalez on the flip side, George, uh, Derek, he's got talks about John Moran saying, hey, which era would be, give, would be good for John Moran? Plus, he also want to know, because we did talk about it Friday, uh, which MB, which era would Wimby fit the best in? And that's also, and he also mentioned the 93 team for the Spurs. Keep that in mind. This is Derek Gervin, Rudy Compos, Jr. Sweep the League. Again, all part of the Alamo City Podcast Network. All you got to do is go to YouTube, hit that subscribe button, become a member. That way you can see when we're going live. We'll be back here in just a minute from one of our, uh, our good buddies, Jeff Garcia. We'll be back here at Sweep the League. Locked on Spurs is your daily Spurs podcast hosted by Jeff Garcia, the lead Spurs writer for Ken's 5 San Antonio. Jeff has a healthy plethora of guests all the time on the Locked on Spurs podcast. You can also follow Jeff on threads at Jeff G Ken's 5 SA. You can also follow Jeff on Twitter at Jeff G Spurs Zone. So make sure you go ahead and give Jeff a follow not only on threads and Twitter, but also on YouTube at YouTube.com forward slash at Locked on Spurs. This is where you're going to be able to find the replay of the Locked on Spurs podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share. That is uh, Jeff Garcia, Locked on Spurs, friend of Sweep the League, and uh, he'll be back on here, Sweep the League, for just a little in a little while here. Uh, this is Derek Gervin, Rudy Compos, and you're back on Sweep the League. And thank you, Jeff Garcia, for being a uh, – a really good sponsor of the Alamo City Podcast Network. Let's get back to some of the chat here, Derek. So before we left, Tim Gonzalez says John Morant. Now, yes, which era would better fit for John Morant? Uh, who would have given him problems? So the Jaws game, I think, is it's this era. I think he would be more dominant this era. Uh, back in the day, man, I don't know. Honestly, <laughs> Honestly, one guy that I can just throw out there that would clamp John Morant down probably would be Joe Dumar. <laughs> you name the exact movie. same guy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, for for granted, everybody can know we didn't we didn't talk about this. I just basically <laughs> said this, but that's funny. I, I think Joe Dumars would clamp John Morant down. But Derek, I'm gonna give you the stage here. You answered it, man. Look, I played against Joe in uh, college. Joe went to McNeese State. Yeah. Well, we played them and we beat them. Um, but if you're just talking about a guy that's going to defend uh, John Morant, for me, there's two guys. And I'll have to go back even further for the other one. But there would be Joe Dumars would be my first pick. And I can name two other guys. It would be Gary Payton. Oh, yeah. 
And then it'll be Walt Frazier. But I know a lot of the younger people aren't familiar with uh, the New York Knicks, uh, Walt Frazier, from back in the day. Yeah. Those would be the guys. I wouldn't say they would clamp John down because John, John is pretty athletic and mm-hmm. he's quick and all that. Let's just say they. I think they will be able to limit Ja. You're not going to stop a great offensive player. And I think Ja's a great offensive player. But I think those are the three guys that will give him the most problems for sure. And the first answer, just like you, would have been Joe Dumas. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Joe. I like those two guys, Gary Payton. I mean, Jeff Garcia's in here. Rudy, you think Gary Payton would clamp Ja? He'd give Ja some major, major problems. I have no doubt about that. Uh, funny because Jeff actually is back in here, and he mentioned another guy. I was going to say Derek Harper was another another guy, but I was thinking Ron Harper. Yeah, now he's been – well, Ron, but I don't know now because Ron Harper, that's a good – I mean, Derek Harper is a really good pick. Oh, yeah. uh, one thing Derek Harper was good at, though, was a 94 feet uh, defense. Yeah. You know, turning guys, dealing with Ja in the half court. I think Ja might have a little, a few advantages. If you're talking about bringing the ball up the floor, then I can see that. But in the half court offense, after setting screens and all that, and then getting Ja in positions to succeed, I think he would give Derek Harper uh, problems because of the size. Derek Harper was like 6'2. Yeah. And, you know, Ja could elevate over him. But Derek's definitely going to be there. If it's a physical game, if you're allowed to put the arm bar and stuff on there. I would give Derek a very good chance. But the reason I said the other guys is because they had long wingspans. When you mentioned Gary Payton, you're already talking about 6'5", but you're talking about a guy that's 6'5", and long arms. Dumars is another one. Dumars didn't really have to always put the arm bar on you. If you watched him guard Michael Jordan, Dumars had very, very good, I will say great, lateral movement. Yes. And that's what you got to have to deal, even think about dealing with Jock. So the three that I mentioned, Walt Frazier, very good lateral movement. Those would be the three guys for me. Uh, Derek Harper, if it was bringing it up the floor 94 feet, but in the half-court offense, it would be those three guys that I mentioned. Yeah, Der- I mean, Derek Harper's another good one. I always looked at possibly uh, – I mean, I, I love Alvin Roberts. So I'm going to keep him off the list. I know he's a cl- he's a really, really top-end defender, but – I, I would even go with a guy like a Michael Cooper would be another guy yeah. who I think would There's definitely get with long arms, long arms as well. Also, man, I'm going to throw a name. I, I got to throw a name out here, Derek, because thinking about John Moran, he's a lot bigger than Ja, but I think defensively he could probably keep up with him. And again, nobody really has heard of him. I'm pretty sure unless you're a, an old hat like me, Derek, and probably uh, Jeff Garcia was Bobby Jones is another guy that came to mind. <laughs> who I feel that could possibly stop Ja if they was in that era. Bobby Jones could guard one through four, even back then. So and I, I think that would be a good matchup because he's a guy that it seemed like Bobby Jones never got tired. Yeah. And uh, I interviewed uh, Bob McAdoo two years ago, and the interview was about Bob McAdoo. But when we got to North Carolina and we started talking about Bobby Jones, I mean, Bob, it's like McAdoo forgot the shows about him. And he started talking so much about Bobby Jones and all the things Bobby Jones brought to the game. So, yeah, I would definitely – I would never go against you when you mention a guy like Bobby Jones. Uh, I wish some of the young people would look him up. You you know who Bobby Jones kind of reminds me of, but he was better offensively to me. He reminds me of a guy that was flexible like Andre Iguodala. Oh, yes, another another good one. You can have guard one through four. You can have uh, Iguodala guard Steph Curry – or you could have him guard Clay Thompson. You could have him guard Andrew Wiggins. You could have him guard Draymond. Those kind of guys are rare. Yeah. And so that, yeah, but I would definitely say Bobby Jones. And when you talk about defense, Bobby Jones is one of the greatest that's ever done it. Oh, yeah. You're mentioning uh, another guy that gets recalled. Uh, John's in here with Damon Stoudemire, another great defender. Uh, Dennis Johnson, another good one. I mean, you're talking about guys that can really give Ja a whole lot of problem. Uh, to me, John ja Morant's classic NBA comp is David Thompson, George Gervin rival, but Thompson was like 6'4 and 210. So the comparison from the Jew show saying that he's a comp is like David Robinson, uh, George Gervin's rival, David Thompson basically for John ja Morant. How do you feel about that comparison? Because, I mean, hey, man, David Thompson was a scorer, brother. <laughs> if we talking about both of them in their prime when they're both healthy, I love Ja. But, man, I got – I don't know. People need to get on that uh, YouTube 
Uh, David David Thompson is another. That's another conversation for me, man. <laughs> He's one of the what if guys, Rudy. That you know that they always talk about. Yeah. If they didn't get hurt, and you know, because um, you're a big fan of Brandon Roy. Yes. And so am I. And I put David Thompson, uh, even, you know, over guys like Brandon Roy. David Thompson is the kind of guy that you would have in the conversation with the Michael Jordans, the Dr. J's, and all yeah. of those guys. And I don't think Ja fits into that category, but David Thompson certainly does. Yeah, man, David Thompson was huge. I, I kind of like this, too, by the Drew Show. He says Ja couldn't have played in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Let's be honest, he's light in the ass. An undersized hand checking ends John Moran. I think if the hand checking is more into the game like it was back then, you, you're definitely slowing Ja down. There's no explosiveness. Yeah. I mean, there definitely is not any explosiveness because if, if Ja's going to be explosive back in that era, let's take the 80s, for example, he'd have to have a body like a Dominique Wilkins. Um, he'd have to have the body – uh, I mean, if you want to go even more explosive, like a Larry Nance, I mean, he's got to have that stout body to where he can exactly the shooting is the biggest, biggest issue right here. Yeah, the not shot. a good, not a very good jump shooter. Yeah, shoots no, more, no. He shoots actually shoots more of a set shot. Yeah, exactly. So that's that, that's why the guys see the guys with the arm bar, they could direct Ja to where they want him to go on the floor. Yeah, and by him not being a really good uh, jump shooter, that would make those guys defensively much more effective on him. Yeah, man. I mean, we're naming a crowd load of good defenders. I don't think everybody's realizing, like, there's no defense in the NBA today. Well, no, because it was all left in the past, Eric. I mean, all the great defenders were in the past. They, so there's still a few. They just don't uh, They do not do it as consistently. If you Even with Kawhi. And as you know, Kawhi is my favorite player, has been for since 2014. Yeah. He has a tendency now, and I know he's been injured and all that, so he turns it on basically when he has to yeah. defensively. And Paul George is the same way. Uh, two really good defenders, and they're on the same team. But as you notice, they used to lock down guys more consistently a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But injuries make guys start picking your spots uh, defensively. And that's what Kawhi does. That's just the era we're in now. It's not that they're not great defenders. They just don't uh, focus on it as much as they used to because the game has been changed into more of an offensive game to fit the offensive players. Yeah, it reminds me of that uh, baseball commercial where it's Tom Glavin and Greg Maddox where chicks dig the long ball. So uh, they go start doing batting practice and start nailing home runs and all that stuff. I mean, offense. Don't leave Smolty out of there, man. You're going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Locked on here. Where would, have, where would have Brandon Roy have ranked in the game if he didn't wow. get injured? I, I you, you know how I feel about Brandon Roy. I mean – could I say he was one of the – would he go down as a top 75 player? Uh, yeah. I think so, Rudy. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have any doubts that he's top 75 player. Does Okay, better question, you know, because Jeff asked it. I like this better question. Would he have won an MVP in his time frame had he not been injured? I don't know if he would have won a championship – I mean, MVP because he was in Portland. And mm -hmm. I don't know how – it depends on how their team turned out. I mean, if Portland was right there in the running every year, there's a very good chance he would have um, won an MVP. But, you know, sometimes, Rudy, you could play really great and you still might go through your whole career and never get an MVP. Yeah. So there have been guys that have played – if you're second best player in the league, that, that's still not winning an MVP. Yeah. So I can't say that he would have won an MVP, but I know that he would definitely been in the running. And yeah. I, I'm a big Brandon Roy fan. Um, there are guys like him and Reggie Lewis that I always have questions about what they could have been if they didn't get hurt. And then, of course, there's Derrick Rose as well. I won't say Len Bias because we know the tragedy that he suffered. Yeah. But, yeah, Brandon Roy is right in that same rim with uh, the Derrick Roses and the Tracy McGrady's and those guys. And I think Brandon mm -hmm. was a top of the line. For me, he would have definitely been the top 75. Yeah, it's almost like the all what if team that we can go off of, you know, uh, Reggie Lewis, Brandon Roy, Tracy McGrady, Grant Hill's another one. I mean, he had great seasons, but ankle injuries derailed uh, Grant Hill. Yeah, yeah, Yao Ming. Yao Ming's another one. Yao Ming. I mean, even, I was going to say, even Arvidas. Arvidas. I was going to say, even Arvidas. I mean, we, we've we talked if Arvidas came in his prime. Yeah. I mean, what you're, what you're seeing now from Nick, uh, Nikola Jokic, 
is what you would have seen from Marvitas back in the day. Exactly. Let, let me let me say this to the fans about one guy um, that gets a bad rap, and the reason he got a bad rap, you know, he suffered uh, some shin injuries. Yeah. Uh, but he gets a bad rap because he was drafted before Michael Jordan, and that's my former teammate uh, and one of my best friends, Sam Bowie. Mm -hmm. Sam uh, had a very high his, uh, his skill set was very high, but a lot of people didn't uh, give him the you know, the credit he deserved because his career was cut short by injuries. But this is a guy I practice with every day. Uh, he could rebound the basketball. He could block shots. He could put the ball on the floor. He could shoot the jumper. Uh, he could stretch the floor. He kind of reminds me, you know how Carl Anthony Towns always talks about how well he shoots the ball and he's the best shooting big of all time? I would question that. Um, Sam would be the guy that I would question. Uh, Cause Sam uh, could do it all, man. The guys, you know, I told you he suffered three or four uh, catastrophic, I mean, you know, catastrophic injuries, shin yeah. injuries, and so he was never the same player. Uh, but I would say Sam Bowie's right, you know, right one of those guys. Yeah, Sam Bowie's another one, and man, the, uh, the one guy that I, I, I love that I have his jersey. I mean, that's how much I love this player. Um, was Drazen Petrovic. I mean, he was just getting started, Drazen. And he, we've heard, we know the story, Dave, basically from what you were telling us about when Drazen got into uh, New Jersey. But that, there's so many what ifs in the NBA that we can we can do an entire week's show of what ifs in the NBA. Because, I mean, all these guys we mentioned, Drazen, I, I mean, then you could even go what if segments of like, what if this player was on this team? You know, what if, uh, what if, Jeez, man, there's so many. I don't know. What if Oscar what if Schmidt everybody... came to the NBA? I mean, we could go on and on because a lot of people Schmidt... don't know. If they do, they should remember Oscar Schmidt if they watch the Olympics. Yeah, Oscar so, Schmidt. I mean, he treated Andrew the NBA, Gaze. man. It's like yeah. when we play, he played against the NBA, it's like his light came on. Yeah. Since I'm not going to the NBA, I, I choose to stay here and uh, <laughs> maybe reach overseas. But let me show these guys what I could have done if I was in the NBA. So, yeah, we could go. There's several guys that we'll never know, but those guys were up, were at the top level of their games. Yeah, I mean, we can go a whole lot of stuff with uh, – you mentioned Oscar Schmidt. I even mentioned guys like Shane Hill who played here for a little bit. But I mean, <laughs> Shane another Hill, guy, I swear. Another one, um, Andrew Gay is another one that just came at the very end of his career and decided – Play ball. John was typing out Sam Bowie. We got to get to a what if, Jared, because there's so many what ifs on Sweep the League here. We're going to let Tim get in here. This says, let's say, what if Wimby was on the 93 Spurs team? Could he have won and beat the Bulls? Could they have won and beat the Bulls? <laughs> That's a big one, man. That's a huge one. I, I don't know, man, because I'm you're talking when you start talking about Michael Jordan and getting to these championships. It's, it's hard for me to go against uh, Mike, period. I don't care who the p people you bring up. So you bring up Wimby. The reason I still say the Bulls is because I would even say the Bulls if it was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Mm -hmm. And I had Kareem and Mike one and two overall in either order. But I don't know if Wimby would have um, gotten them over the hump against the Bulls, but it would have made it a lot more interesting. I'll say that. Yeah, it would have been pretty, pretty interesting in that era. And just think – I think Wendy would be successful in that era. I don't think he would have averaged a whole lot of points because, yes, it was a big man era, but it would have been an adaptive era because, again, you had Patrick Ewing. You yeah. had um, a lot of these guys that were low post guys. So bringing in a 7-4 guy in that era, you would bring them outside of the post, which would be a little different. Mm -hmm. But, again, it comes back to bodying up. They were able to body up a lot on this hey, Rudy, If it was 96, that 96, 97, 98, 3P, then I would, if the Spurs could have been in that, I would give Wimby a better chance. It's hard for me to give him a chance in that 90, 91, 92, that through the 91 to 93, because that, that time Mike was still at the apex of his career, and I think it would have been hard for anyone. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Sam Bowie had skills, just shins of clay, tragedy. Yeah, I mean, it just happens, man. I mean, Greg Oden's another guy who I was I mean, gonna mention, big Greg, oh, but don't worry, not even mention Greg because Greg was more like Bill Russell. Uh, Greg wasn't going to do a lot for you offensively, but if you're just talking about defensive end of the floor, kind of like a Bill Russell, Rudy Gobert, yeah, they be, yeah, they would make their impact on the defensive end as opposed to making it on both sides of the ball. 
Yeah, definitely, man. I think Greg would have been, like you said, a great uh, defensive player. He wasn't gonna. He wasn't giving much offense even on Ohio State when he no, was playing he wasn't there. Giving much offense, no. um, I don't really consider the high school level. If he's scoring, you know, thirty in high school, I mean, Kendrick Perkins was dominant in high school. Well, man. He high scored school thirty because he's seven feet, and you know, next guy, the guy Garland, about six six. Yeah, and then you got you, then you got to also factor in a lot of his uh, points too, or uh, putbacks. Yes. You know, yeah. so they weren't all like all coming out of the offense. A lot of them were put back hustle plays because if people remember Greg Oden for a big man, he moved pretty good. Um, he hustled, and that's how he got a lot of his points. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. So Jeff's back in here. Uh again, this is a sweep the league. Derek Irvin, Rudy Campos Jr. Monday through Friday, two to three thirty. Uh it's flashback Friday. Like I said, we got topics left and right, but uh we just can't seem to get to those topics, and I don't care. I love talking old hoops with you guys and old NFL, old everything. He says, What do y'all make of speaking the speaking tour that Pippin, Luke Longley, Horace Grant are doing to tell their side of playing with Michael Jordan? Now I haven't really heard uh what they were saying. I gotta do a little bit more research on that, Jeff, but if it's being brought up, I'm sure they're probably not saying anything good about Mike. Um, you know what, Mike, Mike as a player, I, I again, I don't, you know, when I played against Mike, it was on NBA Live or whatever video game system I was able to play him on as. Um, but you hear the stories about Mike being a teammate, Mike uh, being hard. But when you want to win as bad as Mike did, you're going to be hard on your teammates every single moment of every single day, Derek. Who, who would know um, – we would know who Scotty is because Scotty was a great defender and he wasn't bad on the offensive end of the floor. But will we even know who Luke Longley is or who Horace Grant is? Horace Grant went to Orlando, as you know. Mm -hmm. Did they win a championship in Orlando? No. So people, they can talk all they want. To me, it's just uh, sour grapes, man. I mean, the show was supposed to be about Michael Jordan. It yeah. was the last dance. So he had to tell his story because he's the one that was the six-time MVP. Hello. So what would they expect the show to be about? Yeah. And I think uh, Scotty's really just bitter because Mike brought up the incident when Scotty chose to sit out uh, when the play wasn't run for him. The play was run for Tony Kukoc. Yeah. And it seemed like just because Mike brought that up, that seemed to really get Scotty started on all of this. They went from being really good friends and then that comment kind of, uh, you know, spoiled their relationship. It's kind of like when uh, Jordan and Charles Barkley, if you remember, Barkley did the same to Jordan when he said that Mike wasn't a great owner, wasn't doing so great in Charlotte, and that ended up fracturing their relationship. Yeah. And I think this is just spoiled uh, grapes on sour grapes on uh, Scotty's part, doing anything he can to uh, get attention these days, and now he wants to bring Luke Longley and Horace Grant in it. And I think those guys should just be uh, happy that they got an opportunity to play with Michael Jordan and they got some things that you could never uh, take away called NBA championships. Yeah, man. I mean, you can't fault. I mean, you know what? You're right. If for not for Mike and, you know, even for Scotty, Luke Longley, you know, would have been the guy that was in Minnesota for a while and had an okay career, you know, bounced around Horace Grant. I mean, Horace Grant was great in Chicago, but – I mean, he still was good in Orlando. So, I mean, again, he's making his name off of Scotty and, you know, Mike went to Orlando, got, you know, his name off of, you know, Penny and Shaq in there when they well, made the NBA finals. Well, what would Luke be upset about? I mean, he had to spend time with, uh, remember you had Bill Winnington? Yeah. But you had other guys. And, uh, Ed Neely. And Ed had Neely was Will there. Purdue. Yeah, Ed Neely was there. Yeah, the Ed Neely, who played with the Spurs at one time. I used to play pickup ball with us. But I'm saying you got the big man. You got Will Purdue. You got uh, Bill Winnington. You got Luke Longley. So Luke should be really be happy to be able to go out there and uh, get a championship. People will always remember who Luke Longley is, who he was, and who he is. And the reason they'll remember that is because he played with Michael Jordan. Yeah, and you're right because I mean you go go along the lines, man. I mean Drew Show put it here. I'm gonna get to this comment in a second here, but go down the line. I mean, without the titles and without Jordan, do, do you really remember? If you're not a deep basketball guy, do you really remember B.J. Armstrong? Probably not. I mean, it's just another don't. guy. I do because he's another Detroiter. Exactly, B.J. Armstrong. You unless you're a deep down basketball guy, B.J. Armstrong is just another name. You know, it's like. 
if I was to mention, you know, hey, remember Greg Sutton from San, the San Antonio Spurs? It's like, who? Like, yeah, if not for Jordan, these guys wouldn't have had anybody. Now, everybody would remember Craig Hodges for the three-point contest. Yeah. But, again, who outside of that would you remember? I mean, uh, Scott Williams is another one, you know, that you would probably think, mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, Randy Brown. I mean, come Pete, on, Randy Pete, Brown. Pete Myers, Rudy, um, the guy who helped me go to uh, Italy and play and who also <laughs> played with me uh, with the Nets. Pete Myers was my teammate. And Pete has never had a problem with it. Because Pete liked the adoration, just of being that word, that word NBA, those words NBA champion, mm -hmm. and it, that go, that comes along with the territory. It goes along with the territory, man. You, those guys should be grateful. Uh, if they had comments and complaints, why didn't they complain back then when they were winning? They were mm -hmm. silent. So to me, I can't tell them to do. They're grown men, but try all they're gonna do is end up making themselves look bad. Because Mike, we all know who Mike is, and we know what he did. And without him leading that ship, they don't win six championships. Exactly. I, I mean, exactly. You cannot fault the guy. I mean, like he was a winner. And Drew saying that Mike had high standards, period. He had to. Mike didn't make high. Scotty sign his bad contract. He didn't give it. He didn't have to put Luke Longley in the last dance to apologize. He did Luke's doc and provided high, high his footage. So, I mean, yeah, it. I mean, Mike is the reason why a lot of these guys are known. I mean, you know, plain and simple. That's the reason why a lot of these guys are on the last dance. And you're right. It was about Michael Jordan, his last, you know, who ran the NBA, his last title. There's nothing more to that. I mean, yeah. If, 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 um, if LeBron was to do a documentary, I mean, how many things does uh, Mario Chalmers really expect? Does Mario Chalmers expect <laughs> it to be about himself or is he expected right. to be about LeBron? Yeah, it's kind Mario. of the same thing. Yeah, Mario's going to want probably, you know, 45 minutes to an hour worth of airtime, you know, if he's on the LeBron documentary. And then you're going to have Mike Miller on the same tour talking about, you know, the LeBron James documentary and everything like that, man. I mean, definitely, you know, and Mike can play the game. He sells merch. He's the GOAT. You know, that's according to what John is saying here. Uh, bringing up – Jim's bringing up Gene Banks. Uh, Tim says he remembers B.J. Armstrong as well. Uh, we got a lot more. We're going to get into a little bit more here. MVP talk. We're going to move on here. We got to take a quick commercial break here. We'll be right back. Derek Gerber and Rudy Campos, Jr., MCS General Contracting. MCS General Contracting, more than 30 years of combined experience in concrete placement. They are the best in the business. Honest pricing, high quality work. They get going on house foundations, driveways, concrete patio decks. If you want to extend the deck, extend the driveway. If you're a business and you need to put together a slab, a parking lot or other concrete placement services or sidewalks. Reach out to MCS General Contracting at 210-774-9155. They're confident in their skills, so give Chris Leha over at MCS General Contracting a call at 210-774-9155. And thank you for being a sponsor of this show. Yeah, I'm Sir General Contracting. Appreciate you, Chris Leha, for always being supportive of the Alamo City Podcast Network. Uh, again, just go to YouTube. You can find us there, Alamo City Podcast Network. Hit that subscribe button. Join us, myself, Derek Irvin. Gio will be back tomorrow. Uh, Rock will be back probably throughout the week as well. Uh, real quick, we're going to get into Thursday. For all you guys that have NFL draft questions, be on that show Thursday. We've got a mock draft guy. He's going to be on the show on Thursday talking about all the NFL draft stuff. So we've got a bunch of NFL topics coming up on Thursday. So, again, Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr., getting some questions here. I'm going to make a post so we can get it for a mock draft guy ready for him. He's going to be our sweep the league uh, draft guru. So definitely. What do you got there? Hey, Rudy, I won't be a part of that show. But, man, uh, this is going to be interesting, that top ten, because uh, we're going to be – it sounds like it's going to be a bunch of receivers that are going to yeah. be in the top 10. I've heard like possible four or five receivers going in the yeah. uh, top 10 picks. Yeah. And that would be like amazing. Well, so I'm going to tune in. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely you got Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, from Ohio State. Um, Malik Neighbors, LSU. Keon Coleman is another one that's getting talked about. Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky, who I feel is probably the steal of the draft. Um, I, I'm – I've been trying to write Andy Reid and text Andy Reid like, hey, you need to get this kid for Pat. I mean, this is a guy that you want to get for Patrick Mahomes and Malachi Corley. But you're right. The receiving class is it's, it's good this year. Uh, but it's that it's that quarterback position that has everybody frazzled because everybody loves Caleb Williams. 
I'm not a fan of Caleb Williams. Um, I, everybody loves Drake May. I've got questions on Drake May. Uh, but, you know, there's this this draft class is going to kind of – it's tough, Derek. It's going to be tough because the Chicago Bears hold that number one spot, and they can do whatever they want with it. They can keep Justin Fields, make some trades. They can get rid of Justin Fields, get a bunch of picks. It's just amazing how good Chicago can be if they make the right decision on thir- and on the draft day, basically. I hope it's, those guys do well. But Caleb Williams has showed um, some weaknesses. It's going to be interesting for me um, what happens to Michigan's quarterback, Mr. JP. Um, we don't know where he's going to go. So he seems to be the biggest what if in the draft. Uh, people still don't know if he's going to be a successful quarterback or not going to be successful. But uh, he did do uh, very good things in Michigan. Yeah. So I'm going to – the young man, I believe he only lost one game maybe, one or two games. So I'm going to uh, wish him well. But it's going to be interesting, and I'm going to be tuning in as a fan on Thursday. Yeah, for sure, man. And J.J. McCarthy from Michigan, I honestly, I've got about a third or fourth round grade on him. He's He's we'll got stuff he's got to work out, but I think if he's in the right system and the right you know team, he can sit a whole year, maybe two years, kind of get that Aaron Rodgers type treatment where you come in, you learn from a great veteran, and then you can get your way onto the field. But uh, it's going to be interesting. I, so, I would definitely get into that. Do you, have him, do you have him basically similar to Shador if Shador were to come out this year? No, Shador, I've told you a million times, and I'll say it again, Shador is undraftable for me right now. I wouldn't take – I would take a seventh-round pick on Shador, maybe sixth. Uh, I've gotten a lot of flack over it. And, you know what, just look at the tape, man. I mean, I feel like with Shador Sanders, his best move is to get away from his dad and join another program because he'll get that extra coaching that he needs. Mm-hmm. Go to, should have gone to a USC if he wanted to stay over there, and you know the the west the west coast, or go to Oklahoma. Go somewhere where you can build your your quarterback resume up. Uh, and I mean, hell, even if he was to go to the SEC, just go to another program where your dad is not involved in it. Get that extra coaching from another coach, especially a good coach. And see where you fall, man, because I still think if he's under Dion, I don't have him draftable in my opinion. That's just me right well, now. He needs someone like a Cliff Kingsbury or Lincoln Riley, so I agree with you. Yeah, definitely Shadir Sanders. So we'll see what happens with Shadir. Uh, Drew shows back in here. Let's be honest. There is LeBron James documentary. We want to know what went down between <laughs> LeBron's mom and Delonte West. Delonte went from rapping about KFC to homeless in the streets. That's – that's kind of a documentary in itself, I think, <laughs> something like that. But um, definitely can't wait for Thursday's show. Uh, Tim is saying Dwayne Carter. Yeah, definitely. And John's wondering what round will Rudy be drafted in? Every team needs a great water boy. I I can – you know what? If if Jerry Jones wants to pay me, you know, 500000 to pass out water, who am I to turn Jerry down? I, I definitely would, would take him up on that offer. Well, um, the, you, you might be in the same category as Thanasis, because in my mind, Thanasis maybe <laughs> should be a wall border boy, a ball boy, but hey, it is what it is. I don't think Thanasis, like it's, I'm saying, I don't think he can be a popcorn vendor at an NBA game without fumbling, <laughs> without fumbling the, the tray, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, man, MVP talk, Derek. So you've got a three man race uh, from what you were telling me in SGA. Jason Tatum and Jokic. Now, for me personally, I don't think we're going to see Tatum even – I think he'll be third in the voting. I don't see him competing with SGA and Jokic. I think it's a two-man race, and I think it's going to be a two-man race based off of both guys being healthy. SGA is an amazing basketball player. I mean, you've seen the growth from SGA from the day he was drafted by the Clippers and now playing for the Thunder. I mean – the kid is unreal. He's doing everything, and he's keeping his team in contention night in and night out. Jokic, I mean, Jokic is Jokic, man. I mean, if I, I, I've made the comment, if I, if there's one player who I think could have a a quintuple double, which happened in the high school ranks uh, this past week by a high school female basketball player, mm, yeah, I think it's Jokic. Now, the problem with him is the blocks. I don't think he can get ten blocks, but. The other four categories, I think he can possibly do it. But what is your race for MVP in the NBA right now? That, those are my three. Right now, I have Jokic number one. I have Shea number two. And the reason I have Tatum number three is uh, because best team, uh, best record in the league, you know, by far. And so best player on the best team. 
I don't think he's going to win either. Matter of fact, I know Tatum's not going to win the MVP, Mm -hmm. but he deserves to be in the running because they've only lost, what, 12 games? And yeah. so that yeah. for me, that's why I picked him. Uh, I, I have to put him over guys like Anthony Edwards, uh, Giannis, and Luca. I have to give him the nod because they because of their record and they've done it consistently all season. I think it's going to come down to Jokic, uh, Mr. Triple Double, and I think it's going to come down to Shea. And the reason I put Shea in there because if I'm correct, what well, they're like 47 and uh. 10 or something? No, 40 and 17, if I'm yeah, correct, off my head. 40 and 17, right? Yeah. And he's had – they played 57 games. Shea has been over 30 points 42 times. Yeah. Out of 57 games. And I'm from a scoring family. And it's not just his scoring. The guy also can defend. He can pass. Yeah. And more than that, Rudy, he's a team player. If you watch him play, he's not taking bad shots. He's playing within the framework of the team. And for that reason is why I have him right up there with Jokic. And you know how I feel about Jokic, man. I mean, what do I have to say? I I posted an article. I posted on Facebook yesterday. I already have Jokic in the top 10 all-time centers. Yeah. And someone told me he doesn't defend. And I told them where I don't know what you've been watching because he does defend. You don't have to be jumping up a 40-inch vertical to play defense. He has very good hands. He knows how to reach in and get swipes, and he knows how to use his positioning. He's mm-hmm. not the, the strongest guy with his, that body, as you see, but the guy is so intelligent. He knows how to put guys in position to fail, and that's what I like about him. And then on the offensive end, I mean, what do I have to say? Is there anything that needs to be said? Man, the guy just does it all. Last night he had 30-something – and 16 rebounds and 16 assists. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what else do I need to say? So for me, it's, it'll be him and Shea running away with it, but I would factor Tatum in there. I have to give him the respect he deserves because uh, he's led them to the number one ranking, even though they have the addition of Drew Holiday and they mm-hmm. had the addition of Porzingis. I still have to give Tatum credit because he's leading that team. Uh, he won't win it, but I can't see anyone else finishing above him. So it would be uh, Jokic and Shea, however they choose to go. That would be decided in the last 25 games. Yeah. But one of those two will win it. And then I would definitely have Tatum third. Yeah, so I've got I've got SGA first, Jokic second. And I, when I say second, I mean you're talking 1A, 1B, and then I have Tatum. Um, definitely, I'm, I got 10 minutes. As very, I'm a hater for Tatum because he went to the best school in the world. <laughs> and, of course, that was Duke. I don't have any hatred towards Tatum and Duke. I mean, I don't like Duke. I mean, I, I would say hatred is a hard word, and I've used it before when talking about Duke, but I've grown up. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I've grown up a little bit, you know, a little here. Rudy, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you'll do when Jerry Jones hires Dion as a Cowboys head coach and burns a first round pick on Shador and a second on Dion Sanders Jr. I'm afraid for you. I am not afraid. So, Drew, I am not a Cowboy fan. I'm a Falcons fan. So as long as Dion stays away from his former team, Atlanta, and I don't have anything to do with them, I am perfectly happy with it. They can go to Dallas and do whatever he wants. Is so, Drew serious, though, about Jerry Jones hiring Dion? No. I know Drew, Drew knows better than that. Jerry Jones is not bringing in anyone to be the face of that organization over Jerry Jones. He's proven that time and time again. If he got rid of Jimmy Johnson and Bill Parcells, Dion doesn't stand a chance. Man, you know, what's funny is not well, last week or a couple weeks back, maybe they – he brought in Jer- uh, Jimmy Johnson as an advisory guy. So maybe Jerry's getting a little soft. I don't know, man. I mean, that's well, Jimmy should Jimmy should have never been fired. He should have been there as long as Tom never. Landry. Jimmy should have had the probably the the pop treatment, the Belichick treatment. Like Tom Landry. Of, yeah, Landry's another Landry firing was the biggest. I the biggest well, what in the okay. hell? Well, yeah. That was the biggest what in the hell there ever was, if there ever was one. But what's funny was when Jimmy was fired, I was it was it was on a school night. I remember because I woke up at like two in the morning. And I think I was just I was feeling sick, turned on Sports Center, and that's when I heard about Jimmy Johnson being fired from the Dallas Cowboys. And I'm like, are we serious? Like, man, well, I gotta be why, true. Why didn't they mail that man a ring for the, the following year when they brought in Barry Switzer? 
<laughs> no idea, man. No idea whatsoever with that whole scene. Jerry, Jerry's just kind of his, he's in a world of his own. I mean, Jerry's Jerry. I'm gonna give him credit though, Rudy. He's if you look at what he's doing now with that stadium, man, the guys uh he, they have boxing, it's a boxing venue now. I mean, they've done it all. One thing we can never get on Jerry about is being a very, very smart businessman. Yeah. Some of his football decisions have been a little questionable, but now he's got another one coming up. And I'm sure you guys are going to address that on Thursday as well, right? With his uh, Dak Prescott sixty million dollar talk. Yeah, we actually talked about it last week, and you know, it, again, I can ask you about it too. With Dak Prescott getting ready to uh, reset the quarterback uh, page pace pay scale, basically sixty million a year. Now, again, I am an advocate. Don't pay Dak all that money. But then the other guy on my shoulder is saying. Well, with none of the top quarterbacks, Herbert, Mahomes, all these guys not being a free agent until 2029, who in the hell else are you going to pay? If if you go by what they've done on the field didn't uh, or the voting off the field, didn't Dak finish second in MVP voting? Yes, he did. So when you that's part of your resume, right? So when you and your agent go into the front office, you do have a leg to stand on. Uh, a lot of people might feel Dak is not the uh, quarterback for that team if you're talking about winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. But you can't ignore you can't ignore what he's done. And it wasn't us that voted him second in the NFL. So I guess he does have a leg to stand on. But re- whether they do it or not, uh, that's the remaining question because they still have to pay uh, guys like Michael Parsons, C.D. Lamb, and those guys. So we'll see what happens. But I'm never gonna hate on a man on his money. So I- I'm wishing Dak well. Hey, if you get paid, you get paid. I mean, it's not your fault for getting paid. If they are, if they put the money on the table and you, it's for you, you take the money. I mean, that's that's the way it works. I mean, and again, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of paying Dak $60 million a year, but I understand why. I mean, you're there's no better option out there. There's no quarterback you're going to draft that's going to take his spot. I mean, you're, you, it's sad to say, but you're stuck with Dak Prescott as your quarterback because you go less than him. There's nobody there that's going to help you win. You can't get any of the higher guys. So, I mean, you can go out and get a Kirk Cousins, but you're not paying Kirk Cousins all this money, and you can't even really trust Kirk to be healthy. Dak, exactly. Dak is usually healthy. And we know um, it kind of backfired on the Cowboys. With it, You know, that could make them kind of leery about it because of the Ezekiel Elliott situation when they gave him that $90 million, and he ended up getting hurt. But you can't hold that against Dak. Uh, Dak has been pretty much healthy throughout his career. And if you look at the stats, I mean, he's thrown for 4,000 yards. He's done this. He's done that. He's done everything but win a Super Bowl. So Lamar Jackson hasn't won a Super Bowl, but we saw what happened with him. He got paid. Yeah, I mean, again, you're going to get paid. And, you know, Drew shows back in here. And Jerry is a businessman because he makes over a billion a year after expenses with the Cowboys. Crazy. That's all Jerry is, man. Jerry, Jerry's a business guy. I mean, for – it's funny because I think I, I like I keep thinking like this and I hope I'm wrong. But when I look at Jerry Jones, I look as a guy who's a fan of the game, mm-hmm. doesn't really care about the outcome. He just says what he says <laughs> on the radio in front of cameras, in, front of, the in <laughs> front of the media, because why? Because at the end of the day, Jerry doesn't give a ass crack right. what you think or what any media person thinks. All he knows is that I have an NFL team. I have America's team. I'm making more money than any of you guys will see in your entire lifetime. Who cares if we win games or not? Oh, Cowboy fans are mad. Well, guess what? Next season, we're going to compete because (laughs) the job of the Dallas Cowboys is to be Super Bowl champions, and we are going to be Super Bowl champions. When When he's gone in his limo, Derek, he forgot. He's the opposite of Steve Ballmer with the Clippers. Yes. Steve Ballmer loves the game, but Steve Ballmer really wants to win. Uh, but you said it. J- Jerry says all the right things in public. But once he leaves that camera, man, Jerry's so happy. I mean, the guy, he got Jerry Jones and you got Stephen Jones. And they still have the <laughs> title of America's team. So it really doesn't get any better than that. And it's funny because you hear a lot of people say, well, well, what do you do? You stop supporting the Cowboys and Jerry will make a change. You can stop supporting the Cowboys. It doesn't matter. Why? Because you're still going to tune into the game every single week. You're still curious as to what Jerry's doing. 
there's no way you stop supporting the Cowboys. Me, I'm a Cowboy fan by marriage. I've said it once. I'll say it again. If I want to stay married to my beautiful wife, I have to say go Cowboys at least, what, 16 times out of the year, if anything. So, I mean, let's say play the Falcons. That is totally we know that one well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, man, hey, we didn't quite get into uh, fan storming the court. We'll get it out with you on Wednesday because you'll be back with us on Wednesday. Yes, sir. Uh, I do want to talk about that because not only that, you had Kevin Durant's incident in Dallas. Um, it's just getting real crazy. So I want to get into the fan talk with you. But nonetheless, man, we we spent an entire hour and a half with all the listeners here. And, you know, everything has to come to an end. And we know that this show has to come to an end today. But uh, we'll be back tomorrow, 2 to 3.30. Coach Gio will be back. The Rock should be back tomorrow. Derek will be back on Wednesday. We'll be talking about fan storming the court and everything else that comes out. You guys want to go back in the vault. We'll go back in the vault here uh, with Derek Gervin. But again, Thursday, we've got some NFL draft talk. Join us Thursday. It's going to be a whole show basically on NFL draft. Uh, we'll be joined by the mock draft guy on. Uh, he's on Twitter. Just search for at mock draft guy. You'll be able to find all his stuff. I retweet a lot of his stuff. So we'll be going to that on Thursday. But hey. For Derek Gervin again, Derek, congrats to you and the Gervin family on this past weekend, man. It was a uh, it was a blessing. It was awesome to see everything that you posted. If you guys want to go look at it, uh, if you're friends with Derek on Facebook, you can check out all his videos on there as well from this past weekend. Get that uh, interview between Jalen and George. That was a very good interview going to the St. Cecilia lure really? of everything going on. What's up, man? You're the man. And I'm saying that sincerely. I hope people te- uh, really start tuning in. More people. Tell a friend about the show, please. Um, you're the man at this job, man. And, <laughs> and and you're a great friend as well. So I enjoy doing the show with you. I look forward to being back on Wednesday. Appreciate it, man. I try to do it. And the reason why I do it is for you guys like you and Gio and everybody else, man. We want to make sure everybody gets, you know, gets to love the talking sports and you know, like we do at Sweep the League, we sweep as much as we can and we try to cover everything. So I appreciate your words. And yes, you and I have been friends for a, a long time now. So uh, it's going to keep on going and we will see you back on Wednesday. So for Derek Gervin, it's Rudy Campos Jr. For the coach, Gio, for Rock. Until we sweep the league again next time, we'll see you later, Knuckleheads. Hey, yeah, see. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. I saw the, com- the uh, comment. Appreciate you.